All right. Welcome to the University of Badassery podcast, where what we teach is to be a badass, you have to kick ass. And the first ass you need to kick, Mac, is your own. This is CJ Ortiz. I am the metal motivator. Once again, seated next to the epitome of toxic masculinity, the fire-breathing professor of ass kickery, the dean who destroys all things douchebaggery. He is the chief butcher of body brutality for your driveway gym. He <laughs> is squadron leader at the Keep the Blaze Alive coaching squad. None other than Patrick Heavy Metal McNamara. Woo! Yeah, baby! <laughs> <laughs> Mac, we haven't done a podcast. Ten years. <laughs> it's been August of last year, Dang, and bro. here we sit in June of this year. So, did you miss me? Uh, no, because we've been doing other stuff together. <laughs> we've been doing other stuff. <laughs> we've been busy, bro. We have been busy. Yep. Yeah, you know, we were talking off camera a little while ago, just to, something that we say often, because people will comment now and again, they'll ask, hey, when are you guys going to do another podcast? Right. And I'll often say, well, we feel like we do it all the time because we do a weekly live stream, which is two hours long. And then we do a couple of two hour Zoom calls a month with uh, our tier one squad members. So we feel like we're. Uh, yeah, it's this. right. It's it's like a couple podcasts a month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, um, join the squad. Yep. I, I, you know, I say this a lot to you offline, but, you know, I see comments that people make and they i i respect how much they respect you mm. they love you man they love what you do they love what you represent and uh they'll talk about the content itself and it's hard to communicate to them guys we always tell you to join the squad if you really love it that much yeah there's a lot of information there in the squad a there's a lot of information share mm -hmm. uh there's a, a this like a skill set yeah is ridiculous yeah. Yeah. i mean the eclecticness of the squad yeah. is own freaking believable yeah. you know and talk about like a wide field of professions and professionals yeah, yeah. it's off the freaking charts bro yeah off the charts it really is and and so and that's what people don't changing realize lives. We're yeah, changing they, lives exactly they, they don't realize is is you know being uh, closer to Mac and learning more from Mac is a great part of it. That's the, that's the bait on the hook. You right. know what I mean? That's what, that's what draws people in. It's the bait of the hook, but it's not the crux of the biscuit. <laughs> it's not the crux of the, bis mm. the biscuit. Because what you've got to experience is the squad itself, the other members. There are so many just good people, but very able We've got surgeons, lawyers, real estate agents, EMTs, fire, police, pilots, housewives, uh, uh, IT people. Then all, all of the professions where guys use their hands yeah. too. Yeah, you know, so builders, masons, yep. uh, brick, um, <laughs> yep. uh, roofers, carpenters, you know, carpenters. Yeah, All. so uh, uh, teachers. We've got teachers. Mm -hmm. um, Scott Belkin, I'm thinking of him, is yep. one. I think Ben Hawk is a teacher. Mm -hmm. So we've got a lot of very, very capable people, but they're... Did you mention shrinks, too? we got shrinks. That's right. we got shrinks. <laughs> we got shrinks. Yep. So uh, a lot of very, very uh, capable people, good people, and the community that's developed around this is really, really amazing. Now, it's, it's set up in three tiers. So tier three, tier two, tier one, tier one being the highest tier. That's the one where we do the Zoom calls face to face. Yep. And we started doing, we just did our third one here recently. Uh, we do live meetups for meetups, our tier, yeah, one. tier one. So that's three days out here mm -hmm. with Mac. Um, and just great time to hang out. We, we cook food. Yep. Cook food, go to the range, uh, hip pocket training, basic dude stuff, and a lot of pub time. A lot of pub time. Yeah. I mean, our, our squad is now known by the local yep. pub. They know. And they basically closed the place down for three days straight. It's right. <laughs> still somehow managed to get out to the range the next morning. It, 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 they literally close it down yeah. every night. Yeah. They're the last ones to leave. <laughs> and, they're, they're, and the squad members are like helping clean up at the end of the night, too. That? Yeah. Uh, and the other thing is the, the pub owner, after the first squad meetup, told me, hey, you need to give me at least a month's warning <laughs> 
before the squad comes here so I could stock up on bourbon. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and one of the reasons why the live events are so good is because of what happens throughout the year, mm -hmm. which is the Facebook, private Facebook community where they're right. all interacting. But then secondly is the actual Zoom calls. Because the Zoom calls are different than the live streams. The live streams is you and I kind of talking like this, mm -hmm. and then people will type in questions here and there, you know, and we'll answer those or all that. But the Zoom calls are really more for the, the tier, squad, the, the yep, squad, the squad members. members. Yep. And you know, it, I I tell guys too, like not only during the Zoom calls, but during the live meetups, about I remind them about the knowledge base and how they need to mingle with the people that they know right. through the interwebs because they see them on screen and i said hey you know if you're the smartest guy in the room you're in the wrong room right and here within the squad you're gonna learn something yeah so, I'm, I'm always in the wrong room but <laughs> i'm trying i'm working I'm trying to find that dumb room I'm so trying. pick up information share information and galvanize relationships yeah yeah, yeah. so it, it's been it's been really good to have that sort of um you know, close, I hate to use the word intimacy, mm. but, um, that's no, good. I like it's it. just, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's a really good face to face time. But what that does is it creates the, um, the, uh, the dynamic, the groundwork, I guess, for, yep. for the live meetups. And, mm -hmm. um, so, and it's, it's a lot of work. I mean, especially for Mac Oof. because we're doing it in his neighborhood and, Oof. and, <laughs> but, uh, it's, it's very, very gratifying. Like Mac said, there's a lot of, a lot of lives change. So you could say uh, this is, podcast is brought to you by the Keep the Blaze Alive, Pat Mac, Keep the Blaze Alive coaching squad. But Mac, who else is this podcast brought by? Well, we have several sponsors. So, to, uh, yes, this is an empty bottle <laughs> because uh, they don't stay, they <laughs> they don't don't stay, stay full on my stay shelf full. long enough. But Taconic, right? Mm -hmm. Taconic bourbon. Uh, several labels have my photo on the back placard. How about that? Yep, but Taconic, we're, we're, so CJ and I are, we're bourbon guys, uh, in case you don't know. Um, I am a, I wouldn't say a bourbon snob, but I like good bourbon. And this, the Taconic bourbon is without blowing smoke up their asses right. and not because they're spo we're sponsored, right. but it's my favorite bourbon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, the everything about it's great, even the price point. Right. Yeah, but I mean, smooth, 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 smooth. Uh, I, I I dig this company too. So Kill Cliff, yep. right? They do good things. Their um, their charity is the Navy Seal Foundation. Mm -hmm. You know, we donate when we do charity event to the Unit Scholarship yep. Fund. Uh, but these are great. Either the energy drinks, the CBDs, whatever they are, and good clean ingredients. No sugar, no freaking right. crap in these things. Because I don't want to ingest crap. I'm not a human garbage can, no. bro. <laughs> I'm not. Then the other thing that's important to both of us in life. Oh yeah. Besides beer, bourbon, is coffee. <laughs> so our that. buddy Wes Whitlock from Rogue American Apparel also has uh, Invader Coffee. Uh, this is my own blend, the T Max Blaze Ops blend, double dark, baby. New packaging uh, looks like. Yep, new packaging. And, you know, it's funny because these are resealable. So it took me a while to figure out how to open this up yeah. here <laughs> so that I could reseal it. Pretty but right there, yeah, right there. Dude, I, I was just saying yesterday to myself whenever I have a, a struggle with somebody's packaging, I always say, well, this company's proud of their packaging. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, and so, many, so many of the resealable type packages are mm -hmm. so hard oh, yeah. to get open. It's mm -hmm. like, it's what's the point? I love the way this yeah, packaging is done. Cool. It took, once again, it took me a while to figure it out. Because yeah. the first one I opened, I wasn't wearing my glasses. <laughs> and I, I was like, well, it just has to be like anything else. Let me just cut the top off. Yeah, right. And yeah. then I destroyed its yeah, ability yeah. to seal itself. Yeah. But uh, Invaders out of Austin... And they uh, they air roast all the beans, yeah. and it, it's just it's it's, spectacular. it's the best coffee, man. It's it is the best spectacular. Coffee. Yeah. It's really good coffee. You, you, there's a lot of veteran-owned coffee companies out there. There's a lot of coffee companies, period. Right. But uh, most of them are copy and paste. Sure, you know they get it from big retailers, and they just put their name on it. Right. Which cool. I mean, but they're selling a gimmick. Yeah. We sell. Good coffee, or we promote good coffee. And, and, and not a gimmick. One of the things I love about Wes is is that's what he talks about. He's passionate about the process. He's passionate about the mm -hmm. coffee itself. When you talk about other veteran-owned coffee companies, 
it's more it's more about other things mm-hmm. than the coffee itself. They're talking yeah. about the political stuff, or they're talking about, I don't know, um, you know, they're talking about the fact that they are veteran owned, right? Instead of, well, how good is your coffee? how good is your coffee? That's yeah. what matters. So, Invader, Kill Cliff, and Taconic, thank you so much for sponsoring. Thank this you. Yes. Show. No kidding. All right. So this is episode 21 of the University of Badassery. And up until this point, Mac, we had switched some time back to uh, books, mm-hmm. to really more history, right. uh, bro history. And um, <coughs> <we're>, <laughs> we are not historians, nope. but we just figured it's fun to have a couple of dudes talk about, you know, crazy stuff in history. And we've done that with the endurance. With the endurance. Oh, my God. And then with uh, the um, core discovery, yeah. Lewis and Clark. Lewis and Clark. Yeah, those are fun too because yeah. you know, you, you, you an hour and a and a half of us of our banter <laughs> talking about like the endurance and Shackleton mm-hmm. or Lewis and Clark and the core of discovery. It's it's a lot more fun yeah. <laughs> that yeah, way because we're kind of, fun, yeah. we're giving you the Cliff Notes version, yeah. Cliff Notes, Cliff, <laughs> Cliff's Notes version right. of a, a piece of history, but it's it's history that's all about badassery, right? Exactly. And the one we're doing today is no, not an exception to the rule. It's not, yeah. you know. Well, this is this is something actually that you had brought to mind, and um, uh, one of the things that Mac and I share a passion for is uh, attitude, mindset, and these sort sorts of things. And um, Mac brought he has got a lot of that naturally, but so much of of even what people value you for today is is because of what you you know the levels you achieved in the military and what was required of you guys mentally Mm -hmm. to do what you do. And now as you've been teaching people and all sorts of things, you've continued to apply these principles. But I so often hear the question asked or people write in to ask, Mac, what are you reading? Yeah. You know, they want to know what he's reading. And so I thought, you know what, what would be good is to spend some time with some of Mac's favorite little books uh, to get, you know, get him talking about the things that have kind of inspired him. Now, I remember in a recent podcast that you did, which is really where this particular episode comes from today, Mm. um, you were talking to Kyle Lamb, Mm -hmm. and Kyle was asking you about what you were reading, and Kyle's a reader, right? And, um, you know, you said, well, you know, it's not the most interesting stuff in the yeah, world, yeah. kind of sports psych and all yep. of that. But to somebody like me, that's extremely interesting. Mm-hmm. And I think the way mm-hmm. you've kind of processed things and made them real world uh, applicable mm-hmm. is really where the gold is. And I think yep. that's that's going to come through today. So what are we talking about? Well, it, it, so just to kind of expand on what you were saying – Ever since I retired and I started training people on this side, people have tried to define what I am doing. And early on, I was like, ah, that's not it, man. It, it's not. That's not what I am doing because they really appreciated my training methodology. Right. And when I was doing the training for a corporation, they were all trying to define it because they wanted to send out like pamphlets or they wanted to talk to generals right. about this stuff. And I wasn't their spokesman. They were using other people. And I'm listening to what they're saying. I'm going, nope, mm -mm, nope, that's not it. So I started reading some sports psychology books. Mm. uh, And um, they were all, the the methodology all paralleled, was all parallel. And I was like, this is what I am doing right here. This, I just couldn't define it. And and basically what the definition was, was that performance-based training. Right. See, the... People were trying to define what I was doing as outcome-based training. And we've talked about this on podcasts before, where outcome-based training is uh, can be defined by uh, as execution with consideration, consideration of the consequence. Will I succeed or will I fail? It's how many, how much, how fast. And that's not what I was doing. I was giving per- people permission to succeed, to level up. Right. I was giving them permission because I am allowing them to set the standard for themselves versus... Uh, writing down a standard you know some arbitrary standard and say you must adhere to this standard because that's where most like leo and military work is they have to they they train to meet a certain standard right i mean but we're all born different we all perform differently performance can be measured by doing what we can with what we have uh so i started reading sports psychology books and i was and i realized that i love this 
Yeah. I need, I want information. I'm not a good reader. I mean, I, I, you, some, if it's interesting to me, interesting, I can't put it down. And for some reason, sports psychology books, I can't put them down. I need to, I need to see what's on the next page. Uh, so the one we're talking about today, and a lot of folks out there have heard it, is is uh, Lanny Bash with Winning in Mind, with Winning in Mind, this mind. Right. Yep, with Winning in Mind. So, so many of the books I read have mind in the title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. But uh, this one's good, and it's, and it's easy. It's a, it's a, it's, pst, look at all the yellow. No. <laughs> yeah, right. He's got all, all the, uh, all the highlighted uh-huh. stuff. Yep. Yeah, the mental management system and Olympic champions success system. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, from the intro, a PGA Tour player said, with winning in mind as a reference book on the relationship between thinking and performing while under pressure, taught by a person who has lived what he teaches. And that seems to be, and, and, and just from that, I can see why this resonates with you. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting to me, though, dude, is... Um, you didn't leave this mindset with the military. You, you, you know what I mean? You took this with you. You took right. this approach to excelling, but, mm-hmm. but again, not focusing on the outcome per se, right. but it's the, because the outcome takes care of itself. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep. Um, and we'll see more about that in a minute, but, but did you know that that's what you were doing? No, because, and here's the big difference too, is while I was military, it was all about how can I make me better? Right. How can I improve this? Right. Once I retired is how can I make other people better? Hmm. You know, so that was a big, big difference. So how, how do you do that? I don't know. I had to figure it out, you know, because you could just, you could teach something out of a manual. But um, are you really going to make them better or are you just regurgitating something so else? So at the time, you know? though, were you thinking only in terms of uh, the firearm instruction you were doing? Because that's what all you weren't the social media influencer. Nope. then. No, I, I certainly was not. Nope. No. So I, but I was teaching other stuff other right. than the firearms, too. Right. But yes. So that's all I was thinking about is the things I was teaching people. Right. You know, how could I make them better? How could how could they receive it better? How could they consume it better? How could they uh, process it better? All that. So right. all the books, like you know, uh, the Talent Code, or um, or uh, what was the one like Mind Gym, or yeah, um, yeah. Uh, what's the Dr. John Medina one? Is Brain Rules? Okay. You know, how does the brain work? Right. Which allowed me to uh, kind of format my teaching better. Right. If you understand how the brain works. So it's it it was all kind of parallel and reciprocal, right? You know? So for you at the time, though, I mean, because somebody could simply say, "Well, you know, I was tier one special forces, so it's going to be easier for me to get a gig teaching firearms and whatnot." So and leave it at that. Just all you got to do is show up and teach the course. Who cares whether I'm making the people better as people or anything like that? So you. You were already thinking like this mm-hmm. at that time. Yeah, uh, because a lot of guys do that. They're like, well, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a retired special ops guy. People will hire me just because. Yeah. You know, they will hire me. Right. Um, but when it comes to teaching and conveying a message, I've said this a million times, you need to be the right person going to say the right thing to the right person at the right time. You need to tailor training to the individual. You know, it needs to be tailored. And uh, because you can't just tailor the training to a specific group. I like to tailor the training to an individual within the group. Right. So it, and that takes time, you know, it takes time to figure that stuff out. Did you notice, uh, the effectiveness of that early on? Could, could you see the net effect of people feeling like they were, you know, weren't just one of 20 people standing in a shooting line? Not early on because it took me a while to evolve in my teaching. Uh, but I paid attention, right? You know, a lot of like teachers, people on the podium, instructors, um, I think they're just going to go copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, because it's working. Why improve on it? Right. Where I really wanted to improve on it. And, um, I wanted to develop my own 
because I had my own training methodology at the beginning. It was all about delivery. Right. The Mac show. Right. Get you saw I'm gassing up and burn it down. Blah, 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 blah. You know, so, and people love that. Sure. You know, the motivational piece of it. But I started going away from that and becoming more cerebral with teaching because that resonated more. The, it was, I think it was the first time, probably in 2012, I got a compliment from a teacher. Okay. It was in my class, a shooting yeah. class. And that was like winning, you know? Yeah. So I wanted to win more. So how do you win more? Keep developing right. and massaging this training methodology. Uh, because having a compliment like that from a teacher sure. saying, man, I teach all these different classes and your delivery is exceptional. You know, the way you structure stuff. So that became a big focus, the structuring right. and the delivery and then the that performance-based mental attitude type of training methodology really resonated with people. And uh, I had so many people, not early on, but after a couple of years, saying, man, I was so intimidated, but I love the way you format the class. I thought I was way out of my league, which I was at the, fir the first right. day, but man, the second day I figured everything out and, you know, I had a spiritual awakening and epiphany and, and then I was able to uh, perform like her. everybody else. Epiphany. Yeah, yeah, epiphany, yep. Tiffany's sister. <laughs> Tiffany's sister. She's hot. <laughs> Tiffany's sister. You just didn't used to date epiphany. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so you started, you were growing in this. Mm -hmm. Again, not, social media wasn't really a part of your equation or anything like that. No. So, you, so what was your goal? Just to be a great, firearms instructor do your own thing what was the well yeah it, 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 initially my goal was to fill the calendar okay and how do you fill a calendar you become your own person you develop a niche right you know uh and early on i think in like maybe 2004 so i started my own business in 2010 right, right working under my own banner and i started filling my calendar a year out in probably 2014 so it took me a couple years you know, to to um, massage the system, let it develop, let right. it let it mature, and and then I, it was probably like three or four years in, like 2013, 14, where I realized, oh shit, all right, you know, less is more. Uh, I, I, it's not about it's it's important to know what to say. It's also important yeah. to know what not to say. All that stuff, and my calendar started filling a year in advance, and people were like, "What are you doing?" I says, and I said, "Well, I don't know." <laughs> Um, I'm making, uh, training fun, interesting, but I'm also imparting a message that people could use outside of the firing right. range. And that's when it started catching on. I had, um, there was in two different classes. I had Olympic coaches. One was Olympic sailboat coach, mm -hmm. coach professional sailors. And another was downhill skier. Olympic coach. Oh, wow. And they said they came to the class not for the shooting portion, but for the training methodology portion. Interesting. I was like, damn, bro. Holy crap. They said, yeah, we're, we heard you running performance based training. And we want to, we want, we want uh, to use your methodology to teach our athletes. Had you ever thought of teaching teachers? Uh, yeah, I would love to. And a lot of teachers come to my class and, um, you know, but, but let's do that. I, I, I never thought about it, but I would love to. Let's let's set up a seminar mm -hmm. sometime. Oh yeah, sure. And, and we'll just have yeah, yeah, yeah. Teachers, teachers, teachers invite of all teachers. Kinds. Yeah, yeah, yep. yep. Teachers and coaches. Yeah. And so we'd have to probably give that away for free because there's no way we could advertise it and sell it because they'd be like, <laughs> "What the hell? A shooting instructor wanted to teach us teachers. We know what we're doing here." I don't know, dude. You're pretty popular. Yeah, yeah. Well, now, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, yeah, now you oh, can yeah, do yeah, it. yeah, 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 yeah. I forget. Um, I'm popular now. Yeah. <laughs> you forget. Uh, small C, right? Small yeah, C. Small C. Um, okay. So anyway, so but so early on, then you you resonated with sports psychology, and a lot of what you've invested your reading time with mm -hmm. is is in this material. Yep. And this book in particular, with winning in mind, how did you come across it? You know, uh, like a lot of people come across books, you buy one. Right. And then somebody recommends another one. You buy it, and then Amazon tells you what you want next. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Which they weren't wrong in a lot of cases. Right. So Jeff There's Bezos only... recommended this. Yeah, right. right, right. <laughs> so they weren't wrong. There's only been a couple times where it's where I 
I bought one because Amazon recommended it. You like this book, so you will absolutely love this one. Right. There's only been a couple of times where they were wrong. Okay. But uh um yeah, that's I think that's how I picked this one up. Which is great. You know, cuz right off. I liked it right off because he and I were the same when we were kids. Uh, you know oh, what I mean? Uh, I, I, you know, I thought about that. <laughs> yeah, right. I thought about that. Sucked at all sports. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He 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 was he couldn't the baseball didn't work, and mm-hmm. then so his dad suggested to him, well, maybe you should play something with a bigger ball, right? So you can catch it because <laughs> right. he was they put him like in a right field where nobody. Yep. And the ball went out, and he t- it just hit him in the head. That and, was me yeah. playing little league. Of my first game, high pot. Yeah, I was. You know, they put me in what is it, right field? Right or field. No, yeah. No, yeah. Well, no, no balls go. Yeah, right. Yep. Because uh, every, you know, the the action. I think it's right field. Yeah, it's right field. Yep. Because, yep. Yeah. And sure enough, high pop pop up. You know, yeah. I go to catch it, missed, hit me right between the freaking eyes, breaks That's my nose. That's exactly what happened to this. Guy. Breaks me right, <laughs> broke my nose. Did it really? When my dad picked me up, he was like, "Oh my god!" Because I had dried blood all over my oh, face. Oh yeah, you probably you know, and, bad. Yeah. And. And the eyes were already starting to, to cause it was, you know, a couple hours before he came yeah, and got me. Yeah. So the eyes were already starting to get black. Yeah. So this guy, uh, Lanny had, um, similar experience. Mm-hmm. So, and his dad was very supportive. Now he was worried that he was going to disappoint his dad. Cause his dad was like a world war two war hero. Yep. Yeah. So he really, really respected his dad, mm-hmm. but his dad loved the hell out of him. And, um, so his dad was like, no, I'm committed to helping you do whatever you wanted to do. Yep. And then, same with my dad. Same thing. Yeah, yeah. So classroom, in a classroom, the teacher, I think, had asked, his teacher had asked um, if anybody, they were talking about the Olympics, if anybody in the class think they could make it to the Olympics, and another kid stood up and says, well, I know who won't make it. Right. <laughs> he pointed at Lanny. Yeah. You know, that's back in the days, too, where bullying yeah. was kind of tolerated. Oh, the teacher yeah. probably just said, Jimmy, now you sit down and be nice. Yeah. But he felt like a loser. He <laughs> yeah, literally, he felt like a loser. And he did, that really affected him. Oh, yeah. No, this, I, I, same thing. You know, I was the last one to get picked for dodgeball right. and for a baseball team. And I wanted to do, I wanted to be an athlete. Right. You know, I went to peewee football in Little League and, right. uh, and I track, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I tried them all. Uh, I mean, finally, I found one that, I stuck with, and that right. was the big thing. Yeah, you know when you suck, you got to stick with it. <laughs> <laughs> that was wrestling, right? Right, yeah, right. wrestling. Because I sucked my first two years, and then I won a match. Okay, and I was like, I want more of this. I want to win again. And if you w- if you want to win again, you got to be self governed. You got to yeah. do shit on your own. Yeah, you know you can't just practice with the team. Right, right. You know you've got you got to put you you got to put the time in. So that awakened something in you. That was oh, that man. was really that in your 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 instance with your older brother. Yep. Those were the they were because about the same pivotal time, pivotal moments. Yeah. Yep, they were about the same. So, time. so the Matt, Matt, the Pat Mac that we see today, so much of that was came out of. Yep, that they was were, that was the crucible. Mm-hmm. They were both at the same time, right around fourteen years old. Yeah. So yep. you know, a lot of people ask for you to write a book about you know your time in the military. No, mm-hmm. um, you're not going to do that, but. Yeah. Really, that's the more interesting story. Yep, yep. Because everything you did in the military was a result of that, but the real personal transformation from caterpillar to butterfly was was there. It was in that crucible. Mm-hmm. That, yep, hundred percent. Yeah, percent. That's when you died and rose again. Yep. So, um, so in this case, Lanny went through the same thing, and so when he's a kid um, and he was failing at these sports, um, he. He hears from a friend uh, about a rifle yep. class. Mm-hmm. And so he goes to that, and he wants to do that. Excuse me for a second. Go ahead. <laughs> Edit. All right. Um, so he goes to that. He goes to this rifle class and is doing that for a bit, and he really, really likes it. Mm-hmm. But then the guy who was hosting it said, well, we can't do this here at this location anymore in fact we can't do this at all anymore wow. and his dad picked him up and he was so grieved you know telling his dad his dad said hey i'm your dad mm-hmm. you know i got your back and the very next day to pick up his son from school he had all the gear rifles and everything to start doing it on their own yeah he found a new location and from then on 
for the next two years, man, it was like it's so cool. A few hours a day, five days a week. It's you know what? It's so cool to have that kind of support mechanism with within a parent, yeah. and that and that's how parents should be. You know, their life. I mean, they're busy as hell, but their lives should revolve around making their family better right. because you are, you know, the patriarch. You right. are the king. And you want your subjects yeah. <laughs> to be the best <laughs> subjects possible. Right, you know, you right. want to take care of them. You want to make their lives better. You want them to be happy. You want them to, th- to see them thrive. Right. Yeah. So this was this was a pivotal time for Lanny, and his dad again played this key role in getting him ready. But that's really where the point of change happened for him. Mm-hmm. And from then on, he was on this clear path to the Olympics. And so it says that story we hear so often from like guitar players and others when they were young, you know, they say, well, everybody else was at parties while everybody else was doing this. I was over here doing this. Yep. (laughs) So he was shooting rifles, getting himself ready for the Olympics. And, um, it's really an interesting thing the the process that he goes through, because early on, kind of like what you just described earlier with when you got out of the military, is that he already started to see the necessity of mental management. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, and especially, well, in any sport, but a sport that requires that kind of level of concentration. You know, in golf, what do they say? Golf is 10% physical and 90% mental. I, I, I could be messing up the numbers. It doesn't matter. You get my freaking point. But in any sport that requires that level of concentration, because, you know, a, a real physical sport, it requires that level of comp, of, um, of uh, concentration, but it also requires, you know, like this aggressiveness and uh, this, this different type of motivation. Right. Where this one requires you to be one with yourself, to be at almost that peace to right. block shit out, right. you know, to, to have that ability to block out the world. Yeah. Yeah. To block everything out. Dude, I mean, holy crap, man. Cause I've competed right. in shooting at a national level. Oh, that's right. You have uh, at a world level. Okay. At a world level, but at, you know, national level was my biggest, uh, like personal, um, challenge. Right. Uh, and that's, uh, and, and people out there know what this, but national match, Type shooting. So, in order to get EIC excellence in competition, which I got, um, you know, distinguished distinguished pistol marksman in two thousand and four. Took me a few years to get it, but I was, I was steadfast. I was adamant. I was um, always working on my own to because I wanted that. I wanted that, and and you know, in in and you didn't win them all. Right. You know, it's funny because that. Uh, <laughs> that phrase, that one of the first phrases in the book, it doesn't matter if you win or lose until you lose, yeah. is so freaking true. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, damn it, man. Because winning is good. Winning's good. Like I said, when I won my first wrestling match, when I was a loser and I won it, and it was a legit win, the, my opponent wasn't a fish. I just paid attention in practice and I used one move effectively and I was able to stick it and pin a kid, right. you know, in, in the third round. So winning is good. You know, the losses, they sucked. And, and people would pat you on the back and say, hey, better luck next time. Yeah. My coach never said, hey, good job. Right. He never said that when I lost. People say that now. Good job. Yeah. No, it's not a good job. You lost. Right. How was it a good job? Mm-hmm. People say that on the range and it pisses me off. <laughs> you know, when I do uh, like El Prez and, they, and it has to be clean and guy will shoot it and uh, one of the students is timing him and he'll say, good job. And I'll look at him and I go, mm-hmm. That's not a good job. He missed twice. Yeah. Don't tell him good job. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's just it's, me. It's so habitual. You right. know what I mean? For yes. people to say yeah. that now. And, <laughs> right. But you're right. It's, you're, it's obligatory. Yeah. We're, we're encouraging the wrong thing. In fact, mm-hmm. he goes into that to some degree. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I forget a lot. Where, where he, he, there's certain things you want to, I mean, there are realities that are there. You mm-hmm. didn't do well. You didn't do this. But he doesn't want to think about those things he Mm -hmm. wants to think only of the good performance right so that he can you know um because it's that that's the old thing when they say if the coach tells you hey uh don't strike out before you go up to the plate now you're thinking about striking out you know what i mean i have a note here about that as a matter of fact it's it's deeper in yeah but yeah i have a note and i'll bring up a point well going back to what you said just a second ago about you know this this shooting as uh as a particular skill set 
um, and the kind of focus and concentration that's required. He has this anecdote where he's talking about being um, on at the Olympics with his buddy, and he said, Jack and I would run three to five miles a day, mm -hmm. he said, to force the resting heart rate <clears throat> under 60 beats a minute. He said, because those little things, that heart rate would affect trigger pull, all yep. that sort of stuff, you know? So he said, if you shoot when the heart beats, when the heart beats, the movement is severe enough to cost you points. You must shoot between between heart heartbeats. <laughs> what? How in the hell? You know? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah so you've really got to be dialed into your body, and you know that's something that I've always was fascinated by. You know, I was talking to uh, a kung fu guru, older gentleman, um, been doing. He owns a chain of schools and all of that. I was talking to him about my daughter, and I said, you know, how cerebral she was and whatnot, and uh, I feel like she needed to catch up, you know, on the physical things. And he, he said something that was, I thought, very in, uh, illuminating. He said, um, yeah, she spent a lot of time in her mind. She needs to spend time in her body, mm. you know. Mm -hmm. Spend time. In, and as we said earlier, as we were, we've been vlogging today, um, shooting video, and we were talking about this earlier, how when we were kids, you know, we— any given summer day would be filled with tree climbing, bike riding, playing baseball, football, hide and seek, throwing rocks, at throwing the stop rocks. Sign. So we were operating, and it's like a, it's like a multifunctional workout, right. it was like cross training almost. Yeah, you know what I mean? That's one day. And that's just one day. So we're working all things in the transverse plane. Yep. Yep. <laughs> um, but you know, you, but we were very one with our bodies. Mm -hmm. You know, it's you, to watch kids, for example come in full speed on bikes, jump off the bikes, lay them down and go into the house. Right. I mean, with, with absolute skill, mm -hmm. you yep. know, no knee pads or helmet either. No knee pads <laughs> or helmet. That's right. Um, so it's, it's, it's a good thing, but this is part of this mental process. And I think what's, and I could see again, the appeal of sports psychology in your case, because it's such a, a isolated way of proving, you know, something a process that you can now take and apply mm -hmm. and this is really the mat the i think what's what's masterful about what you've done since you've gotten on social media because i think that's it, it's one thing to for people to connect to you because of your past and what you've done and i think it's important you know uh you don't need to hear it but you know that's the way people identify mm -hmm. but they they want to be close to that mindset yep you know what I mean? They mm -hmm. want a little bit of what you got. Yep. You know what I mean? That outlook. And mm -hmm. so I think this is a great way for them uh, to do it. That's this, and this, <clears throat> the chapter two calls it winning is a process. And he said, 95% of all winning is done by only 5% of the participants. Of the yeah. participants. Yeah. And this is, so in other words, but the whole argument of the book, Mac, is that you can cultivate this mental management system, mm -hmm. yet only 5% are the actual winners, which shows you only five percent are going to put the uh, put, put the effort the sweat in. equity. Yeah, yep. yeah, yep, yep. <clears throat> because I mean, right there, talent equals skill, and it is acquired, not rewarded. Oh, yep. you know, or not awarded. awarded. Um, too many people nowadays. I mean, I, I could say my kids are guilty of it. They want instant fame because so many people nowadays yeah. have gained instant fame through right. the interwebs and such. Mm -hmm. Instant fame and recognition. Dude, you got to freaking put in the work, man. Oh, yeah. You know, a lot of people have acquired instant fame through luck, hmm. you know, because yeah. they have a gimmick and they were like, I wonder if I put this online and people will watch it. One million views. Oh, I can monetize that. <laughs> but um, yeah, it, talent equals skill and it is acquired, not awarded, which means you got to put the freaking work in. Yeah. You got you to put it in. In the same paragraph, this is funny too, because I, I, I have an anecdote here. When, when have you heard, you've heard me talk about this. Winners are convinced they will finish first. How yeah. often have you heard me say, oh my God. I can beat, yeah. my mindset says I could beat anybody at anything. Yeah. That's what my mindset right. says. I don't care what it is. It could be working out, shooting a bow, putting up Christmas lights, manicuring your lawn. <laughs> I say that I could beat anybody at anything. Can I really? Nah. But right. that's what that's what my mindset says. That's winning in mind. Yep, winning in mind. Yep. 100%. Yep. Winners are convinced that they will finish 
first. Mm-hmm. Man, when I – so it's funny because um, as soon as I read that and highlighted that, you know, this morning when I went yeah. back and, and reread some of this stuff, I was thinking about uh, two months ago, the neighborhood, we did a archery contest in the neighborhood where it was from um, tree blinds and ground blinds and off of an ATV. And, you know, uh, it was through a second floor um, house through a window from the kitchen. Mm-hmm. And I competed in it with the neighborhood. There was about eight dudes there. The big difference between everybody else competing and me, they all had compound bows. I had a recurve. Okay. <laughs> but I thought, you know what? This is what I'm shooting. This is right. what I've been training with. Right. So I'm going to compete with this. It, it didn't pan out for me yeah. because it's a long bow. So like in blinds and stuff, I was smashing into things. But when I went into it, I was thinking, I'm going to crush everybody. Mm-hmm. I didn't. But I didn't come in last either. <laughs> With a recurve bow. Well, it reminds me of one of the stories that he tells where him and, a, and I think it's the same guy, Jack, were going traveling to uh, overseas to an Olympic event. And because there was a chance of luggage getting lost or whatever, they were both bringing two guns. So they each put one of their guns in the other's mm, right. luggage. So in case somebody's luggage got right. lost, there was always mm-hmm. a backup gun. And so they would end up out there not using the gun they originally intended to use and then the there would be inclement weather like they're over there competing with the swedes and Mm -hmm. it's you know it's it's blizzard like weather and and so the they had to learn quickly like watching how the swedes were shooting yep that there would be these little slight multi-second breaks Mm -hmm. in in the snowfall and then the swedes had learned to shoot during those so they did it and they actually were so with the wrong rifle and that weather Mm -hmm. they still won yep yep because it Mm -hmm. was he said but the point was not any of that the point was that those circumstances were against them mm-hmm. but they had winning in mind yep they were still convinced mm-hmm. they were going to win you know uh a, a, a similar um type of uh scenario i was competing in the all army small arms championship <clears throat> and a lot of this was new to me this type of shooting competitive shooting was new to me especially with a rifle stock m16 a2 iron sights 500 yards prone and uh so kd range known distance with pits and butts and all that stuff um i learned quick by watching like the ranger snipers so you have a certain amount of time the targets pop up and you start engaging you engage once the targets go down and it's marked and the targets come back up and you could see the mark at 500 yards you could see it so um i'm shooting right next to a ranger sniper boom we all start shooting he doesn't shoot targets go down they come up everybody's mark is to the right a little bit which means the wind is going from left to right and then he takes a shot boom he just adjusts a little bit he went off of everybody's mark i went i got it bro that's what i'm doing from now on (laughs) use everybody else as a wind dummy yeah right (laughs) yeah it was so freaking clever but so simple yeah you know it's a competition you can i mean it, it, it this isn't combat it's a competition it's a marksmanship competition learn to game it right figure it out yeah yeah okay so uh, the the really the the crux of this book is something that you talk about a great deal and that is performance versus Mm -hmm. outcome yep that's because his his whole thing is if you are outcome oriented you're over trying yep Right, and it just leads to more and more losing. Mm -hmm. And because you're preoccupied Mm -hmm. with that winning or whatever, instead of focusing on performance, um, it's like we said earlier, you know, winning is the outcome of that. So the winning is the outcome. So the true way to have that winning mindset is to make sure you have a winning performance. Right. Yep. So, um, you know, this occurred to me early on, and especially when I started reading, and I didn't know how to uh, verbalize it to people. You know, right. I didn't know how to tell them, don't worry about the outcome. Right. Um, but I was saying, don't worry about the time, don't worry about the score. That's what I was saying. Until I started reading these sports psychology books, and they all say the same thing. Right. Don't worry about the freaking outcome. Right. And like this one here, I highlighted, they are thinking about the outcome instead of the process. Thinking about outcome 
equals over trying. Mm -hmm. So you got to be, and, and one of the things I tell students now is, uh, if you think about the outcome, it will sabotage your ability to perform. And the probability of achieving the outcome you desire will increase once you let go of the need to have it. It will increase 100%. And it's hard for people to wrap their head around that, sure. especially with guys because we have ego, right. stuff like that. So they're worried about time and mm -hmm. they want to be faster. Put it aside. Put yeah. it aside. Think A zone hit, good steel hit, A zone hit, good steel hit, et cetera. Right. Eventually, you know, you're going to get faster. You're going to get better. But if you think about that outcome, it will definitely sabotage the ability to perform, man. So <clears throat> take me through a an example of thinking about performance with shooting. How what, what's what's the process like? Uh <clears throat> well, I have several different courses of fire. Uh one of them I call five second standard. So in five second standard, you start at the seven, you go back to ten, then fifteen, then twenty, etc. And the timers have five seconds on them. <clears throat> you do two shots from the ready position, five seconds. Two shots from the holster, five seconds. Two shots from the holster, strong hand only, five seconds. They have to be all A zones. If you're good at seven, then you move back to 10. Okay. Do the same thing. If you're clean at 10, you move back to 15. A lot of people are shot out at the seven yard line. Right. They'll, they'll miss a shot. <clears throat> the reason being, number one, there's a timer there. Now, they're shooting those two shots in two and a half seconds. They're not using the time. So I tell them, I tell them, guys, you need to freaking stay in your lane. Don't worry about the time. So that's over trying. Right, over trying. Right. Just it, 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 at the end of the this – this one cracks me up. When we're done with it, let's say we go to level three, 15-yard line. I will purposely, because I'm shooting everything with them, with the strong hand – Boom, beep, boom. I'll shoot over time. So we'll go up to the targets afterwards, and I say, how many people graduated all three levels? Nobody will raise their hand. And they're looking at my target. It's clean. Right. And I say, I didn't graduate all three levels either. But I have another name for this drill in my head. I call this drill, I don't want to tape. And they, a lot of them get it right away. <laughs> right. They start laughing. I say, so what that means is I would rather be out as a result of time than to have two horrible shots. Right. I, I, I do not care about the time. Do I really? Yes, I do. <laughs> Absolutely. But the do. thing is, but, but I'm teaching them, don't care about it. Don't yeah. care about it. Just put them in the A zone. And then they'll realize, holy shit, this is a lot easier. Now that I don't have to worry about the time. So that, the five seconds is a sufficient amount of time. Absolutely. But Most of them are going two and a half, three seconds. But because they're worried about that beep in five seconds, they're shooting too they're fast. They're trying too and, hard. And they're missing. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So again, the over trying. And so when you start to really, I mean, obviously he's breaking it down at, at Olympic level. Mm -hmm. um, so that's at, a, that's at a whole nother thing. But I think it's... When it comes to performance in life, yeah. Yep. I mean, everything. Um, well, you bring up a good point here, too, um, with performance in life. This book doesn't apply. It doesn't apply to people who want to be Olympic shooters. <laughs> right. It applies to everything. Right. It applies to, you know, your, your life as an athlete, your yeah. life as a shooter, your life as a businessman, your life as a cog in the system working in a cubicle. Yep. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it's it's it, he just happens to use Olympic shooting as his uh, like catalyst conduit, whatever, to make him to make people perform better right. at whatever the skill set is. Well, this is it really opens something up. You know, I had a, I mentioned to you earlier that I had a conversation with somebody on the way up to your house and it was a coaching call. Um, and this really was a part of the discussion, even though I wasn't necessarily using the terms. But now that we're talking about it. Um, process or performance mm -hmm. uh, versus outcome, I think, and this is just in, in relation to relationships, mm -hmm. is, you know, when things are getting on the rocks in a relationship. And so you kind of get focused. You start over trying. Yep. Right? Because the mm -hmm. pressure is on and you know she's going to leave or what have you. Now you're washing the dishes and bringing flowers and yeah. you want to have the date nights and all these sorts of things. Because you were always focused on 
outcome. Mm-hmm. But if you're focused on process, if you're focused on performance, then you you care about all of those Mondays mm-hmm. throughout your married life, right. all of those Tuesdays, mm-hmm. you know, when it went all that life that's lived in the meantime. Yep. You know what I mean? When you could have been helping out, when you could have been uh, speaking softly, you know, mm-hmm. when you could have been dating her, even yep, right. though you were married. Mm-hmm. But if, but in other words, you just focus on those things. It's like, um, it's like a, I've got a rose bush uh, out front, and you know, it, it those rose buds they all they all close up at night, right? Right. And if I, you know, if I want to show everybody how pretty my flowers are, and I take them out, I'd have to pull try to pull it and what happens it just it'll fall apart, fall apart yeah. but if you just leave it mm-hmm. and when the sun comes out and warms it it'll open up by itself mm-hmm. and we, we we do that sometimes we kind of force our partner open as yep. opposed to, no let me change my process right. let me focus more on the everyday mm-hmm. the little yeah, things yeah, good, good. until they, like it. they begin to open up again mm-hmm. so it really is a universal uh application um but still we're dudes we like to do stuff and it's still important for us to you know, even if we're just doing something as a hobby, to do it well. Right. You know, shooting with a, yep. you're not out there shooting 250 arrows a day mm-hmm. with your recurve just for grins and giggles. Right. You want to get better. I want to get better. In order to do that, you got to put in the reps. In order to, <laughs> in order to kick all your neighbor's ass That's right. in the next yeah, yeah. neighborhood competition. Next year. I'm, I'm, I'm still going to, I'm still going to shoot a recurve next year, next year's competition. And so they've all got the, uh, the, the, what do what you call them? The compound bows? Yeah. Yeah. Compound yep. bows. Those are the ones with all the little gears and yep. things. Okay. Yep. Um, okay. So um, he talks a lot about stuff that's also kind of run of the mill mental management stuff, mm-hmm. you know, affirmation. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, these types of things. Mm-hmm. And this is stuff we've all heard before, but it really is important. Your self talk mm-hmm. is really important. Yeah. And, and, a lot of um, self improvement books, yeah. you know, talk about that affirmations and stuff. Yeah. Me personally, I don't need affirmations. Yeah. I don't need to look in the mirror and say, and <laughs> what like what's his name on L, on uh, uh, old school SNL um, oh, Smalley, yeah. um, Travis Smalley. No, was no, no. Anyway, uh, it's freaking Kurt uh, something Smalley. It's a character that yeah. Al Franken did, right? right? Al Franken, yeah. yeah. yeah you're, yep. you're, 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 you're good. You're anyway. Yeah. It was all this so, this affirmation stuff because he ran like a that that skit was all about art. Smalley, art. art. I don't remember. Ah, shit. Damn it. <laughs> Somebody's, Somebody's out there listening, yeah. going, "Damn it! It's so and so Smalley." Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I, I personally do not need um, affirmation like that. Yeah. Now, one of the things, see, it, 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 he talked about the self-image makes you act like you, yeah. you know? Right. Now, something that I was thinking about this morning is, like, you and I, this is one thing we have in common. We ooze confidence. Mm-hmm. But the reason is, early on, we put ourselves into uncomfortable situations. Yeah. And the biggest one is talking in front of a crowd. Oh, yeah. You know what oh, I mean? Yeah talking in front of a crowd so we both did that for years and years and years and these aren't people you know no these are strangers Mm -hmm. you know so that's a good way to freaking build confidence you know because most people cannot do i know like real badass dudes like in special ops like special forces as a green beret when you do fids foreign internal defense you have to teach classes right or you have to give hip pocket training to other soldiers, or they could be foreign soldiers. Yeah. And the most badass dudes I know would fall apart. Mm. And you could tell that they're not confident because every other word is an F bomb, <laughs> which means they're yeah. not, they're not confident. They need yeah. to freaking throw that stuff in there. That's like their self affirmation. Yeah. I'm a badass. I'm right. a badass. F and 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 every other word. But, you know, um, that's one of the things that uh, we both have in common. And I think that's why is we lose confidence is because we put ourselves into uncomfortable situations early on. You know, it's interesting um, that I forget what it is, but it's like, I mean, it's in the top five, if not top three mm-hmm. greatest fears, fears that right. people have. Like, yeah. like, like next to fear of death. Right. Yep. It's like it's dentists talking in front of a cr- crowd. And, yeah. <laughs> death. Right. Death. Yeah. So, and I remember saying this one time about us. I said, I think you could take 
Mac and I, uh, either one of us, wake us up out of a dead sleep, mm -hmm. throw us in a car, and drive us to a stadium where there's 20,000 people, yep. give us the microphone, and we get to choose a topic, and yep. we could deliver speeches that would act that would sound as if they were prepared beforehand. L yes. Out of a dead 100%. sleep. 100%. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. It's funny. Uh, I, it's so many times people will ask me, hey, can you talk to this group or that group? And I'm like, yeah. I mean, I just talked to a bunch of SWAT cops, you know, in Raleigh. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I remember the guy asking me, he said, hey, don't be nervous. It doesn't matter. You know, I'm like, I'm not nervous. <laughs> well, that was another note I put down here. Yeah. I perform best under pressure. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me pressure. Like, yeah. like uh, in shooting classes. And I said, let me demo this for you. Right. And they were like, oh, man, we're all watching. I'm like, good. Watch, yeah. watch me enter a microscope. That's right. Uh, I don't care. I don't mm -hmm. care because I've done it so much. Right. Another good anecdote because, you know, so much of this, mm -hmm. like the mental game, uh, I think about golf too because I started yeah. golfing a few years ago. And I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. I'm doing pretty good. I mean, I'm a solid bogey golfer. Two, two, two uh, points on that. So one is performance-based. So my objective on a golf course, 18 holes, is to see if I could keep one ball through 18 holes. Mm -hmm. Because most people go through a series of balls. Right. You know, they'll shank them into a pond, into the woods or whatever. Which means I have to put the ego aside. Can I make this with a, uh, with a seven iron? Can I bash it with a seven iron? Or can I chip it over here with a nine and then hit it with an eight? Right. The probability of that is much greater. Just adding a stroke. I'm going to add a stroke. But guess what? I'm going to keep that ball, too. Keep the ball, right. So, and the other thing is, the under, under pressure, I got, I got to tell this anecdote because this one kills me. Um, I go to the same golf course. They know me there. And I'm always the first one out because I don't want anybody in front of me, and I don't want uh, anybody to wait on me. Right. And it only takes me an hour and 40 minutes to freaking hit 18 holes because I'm by myself. Nobody's in front of me. Mm -hmm. And I'm hitting, hitting them straight. One day I go to the golf course and, and the, uh, the, the manager said, hey, Mac, um, can you play the back nine first? We're doing something on the front nine. No problem. I'll do the back nine first. So I went, go ahead and do that. And I go to the tee box number one now on the front nine. And I bash it. And I see that there's dudes up there getting ready for hole number two. Um, and I catch right up to them. And they're a foursome. So there's four dudes all dressed in their hmm. golf shit. And I'm yeah. out there with metal <laughs> bracelets and skulls and crap and a, yeah. a pointy goatee. And I say, hey, guys, uh, my name's Mac. I, I just hit the, uh, the back nine because um, this and that. I was wondering if I could golf in front of you. And these guys were dicks, bro. See, a lot of golfers are dicks. Yeah. Whatever. For, you know, I'm yeah. not a dick. Right. <clears throat> but um, they're all looking at me and they're looking at each other like, they didn't, they didn't want this to happen. And I said, I, won't, I will not slow you down. I swear to God. Yeah. There's four of you. There's one of me. Right. And they go, ah, begrudgingly, you know. Like, yeah. ah. And this, this next, this hole was a, was a uh, par three. And I tee up about this high off the ground with a, in, with a seven iron. And I freaking bash. They're all watching me. I bash it. Boom. Straight up in the air. Boom. Sticks about six inches from the freaking from the from the from the hole oh and i said told you i wouldn't slow you down and i freaking boogie i mean it was it was my best golf shot ever but it was in front of four freaking dickheads yeah, so, so that's, performing that's pressure, under pressure yeah, yeah you know and but i was so confident i was like man these dudes because i could i could feel there i could feel that i could feel it they're burning a hole in the back of my head you know as they were watching me but uh, I perform best under pressure, so that's another anecdote I had here. Well, and I mean that's that's like he said um, at the outset. It was about being able to do that, um, uh, thinking and performing under pressure, mm -hmm. right? So it's in order to do that, you have to become focused on the process itself. Mm -hmm. So whether it's on the range, you know, when you watch your videos or have been in some of your live courses. You break down what you're doing, you know, sight, 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 squeeze, 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 you know, do this, yep. do this. That's all process. Right. You know, so it's so funny. Somebody had asked, they go, wait a minute. 
So what's the difference between the sights and the squeezes? Mm-hmm. What's the, no, he said, no, he's talking about simultaneous, but he right. can't say sight and squeeze at the same time. Right. So he says sight, 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 squeeze, squeeze, right. because they're happening simultaneously. Right. Yes. <laughs> but, that, <laughs> but that's focus. That's a great example mm-hmm. of you literally broadcasting. If we, had, if we could hook the up process. an audio yeah. system to your mind, what's literally happening, happening at that time. Mm-hmm. Now, what he talks about is conscious mind, subconscious mind, Right. And self-image. Dude, how much do I talk about that? The conscious versus the subconscious. Yep, all the time. So a lot of that I got, a lot of my training methodology has evolved because I read these books. Right. I didn't come up with this shit. Right. You know, and neither did he. He was coached by You somebody. just communicate him better. Yeah, well, and he communicated it to me <laughs> better. Right. So now I am doing my part to communicate it better to other yeah. people too. I, I tell people you have to perform the appropriate amount of meaningful repetitions until you can perform something at an intuitive or subconscious level. Um, and, and the reason we need to do that, and he talks about it in here too, is because there's conscious and there's subconscious mind. Right. See, we could only do one thing at a time, right. conscious level. Yeah. Like cognitive thought, so you know? No multitasking. Right. But the thing is, subconscious can do other stuff. Right. But we're not truly multitaskers. You know, we could task switch, task stack, perform certain tasks intuitively. And, and in order to perform tasks intuitively, you have to put in the reps. So it's a martial arts thing. I think it's called Mushin, where you think about it until you don't have to think about it. Okay. You know, Bruce Lee talked about this all the time. Right. You know, uh, but that takes work and it takes repetitions in it. And for some people, it's hard to explain. They say, well, how many? I'm like, I don't freaking know. So my wrestling coach. When I was in um, my junior year, I started getting good because between uh, 10th and 11th grade, I went to the college in summer and I wrestled with collegiate athletes. Mm. And that opened me, that right. freaking. And then I started freaking beefing up and stuff. I was lifting weights. Right. I was a changed person when I came back into high school in 11th grade. But I remember him telling me, if you practice a move 1,000 times, you will be able to do it in every match. And I counted. So it was a throwdown for me. Right. Throwdown. Not the heavy metal band. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but it, the, a throwdown. So basically, like a fireman's carry into a, into a, anyway. So people wrestled who know what a throwdown is. And then there's a contingency for a throwdown. That was a dump in case the guy sprawled too hard. But I practiced it 1,000 times. I, t- I kind of checked it off. I, at home at night, I would go home and how many times did I do a throwdown in practice? And I would check them off. And by the end of that season, that wrestling season, I'd practiced it a thousand times. The next year, I practiced it more, and I was a uh, I broke the takedown record in my senior year. Wow! And most of them were throwdown or throwdown to a dump. Right. Yep. So you, you're getting it down to the subconscious yep. level, so mm-hmm. that your conscious mind can invest in other things. Yeah, like contingency planning. Contingency, that's a good point. Yeah, contingency planning. So contingency planning, a lot of people, and he talks about it in here too. I mean, we don't plan to fail, but we fail to plan, that kind of thing. Uh, We can't. So I tell people, and I don't know if he says it in here. I think he does, but in different terms. Don't look where you don't want to go. Okay. Right? Don't look where you don't want to go. But if if you shit the bed, if your plan goes south, you got to instantly instantly you got to fail quickly you got to right. instantly get your head back in the mix right because you have to program and i do this in life and we talked this about this on this on the on one of the zoom calls is you have to understand that bad things will happen yeah in life in a competition they will happen you don't plan for i mean you don't uh, anticipate them right but you have to plan for them right so you have to plan contingencies because bad things will happen in every competition? No, of course not. In uh, everyday life? No, not every day. But I know that bad shit's going to happen. Yeah. And I have to remind myself that. I mean, I do not anticipate it. I do not wish for it on myself or others. But I know it will. I know it will. And I want to be able to rebound quickly. Right. I want to go right into contingency planning mode. You know, so the, the hell fail quickly versus spending this much time failing or this much time failing. I want to spend as little time failing as possible. So, you, you know, you teach so much on a flat range, for mm-hmm. example. And so you're adding things like the timer and movement yep. and things to, mm-hmm. you know, right. try to make it not so flat. Right. right. Um, but 
if uh, if if the way your if your ability to draw and sight and trigger and all of these things are intuitive if you've done enough reps for them to be subconscious mm -hmm. then your conscious mind has the ability to be tactical in terms of because you're not going to when when you need these skill sets it's not when you're on a range mm -hmm. it's the walmart shooting or right. something like that because yeah. everybody thinks okay well if i was in that situation i would you know yeah well you don't know you don't know you don't know what your regret you don't know what the terrain is you have no idea so you want the last thing you want to be thinking about is okay how do i right. <laughs> you know how do I draw? How do I? You, so you yep. haven't done enough reps for that. Yep. To, you want that to be subconscious so that you can move around with the pistol like it's nothing. Mm -hmm. Just focus on where you're moving. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So, yeah. you know, so conscious mind, subconscious mind, and then self image. Now, these things all intertwine, and he gets into details with little uh, d uh, drawings and things to uh, illustrations, diagrams to show you how they interact with each other. I mean, we could spend all day talking about this. We don't have that time, kind of time, obviously. But this is what you're working on. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, it's going to get to your self-image because, as Max said earlier, the self-image is really what, that's who you are. Yep. That's who you are. And you wouldn't think that these things, of conscious mind and subconscious mind, would relate initially mm -hmm. to self-image. But they do. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, one of the things I tell my uh, students on a two-day shooting course before we start the second day, because there's a couple exercises that when I explain them, they're looking at me like it's bridge too far. Yeah. You know, when I tell them, hey, we're going to shoot stronghand 50 yards, 50 with a mm -hmm. pistol. They're like, I've never gone beyond, beyond 15. So before that, I, I, I tell them this, like, hey, guys, the mind navigates the body. In other words, how we think will determine how we perform. But we cannot outperform our self-image. Mm. You know, we can't. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, limits begin where vision ends. Yep. Yep. So, but we cannot outperform our self-image. Self-image is very, very important. You know, so, and it's hard to improve on it. One of the things that was taught to me by... Um, I forget, it was some performance enhancement type of group that was working with the uh, asymmetrical warfare group. But, um, and I thought this was cool as hell. This one gal told me um, to play a highlight reel. You know, so as seen from behind and above, like there's a camera up right. and behind you. And see yourself going through this, uh, this shooting exercise and see yourself succeeding. All right. You know, just play that highlight reel. Also, play one where you missed something and you had to go into contingency. Uh, yeah. Like you had to do an extra mag change. Right. You had to come out of cover um, in a different spot. But play the succeeding one again. You know, see yourself succeed over and over and over again. So that is a way to help improve that like self-image because a lot of people don't have a, a positive mental image of themselves. Yeah, he talks a lot about that, mm -hmm. about, you know, rehearsing that there were some people who couldn't get to certain, you know, facilities and whatnot to practice for even an Olympic event. Mm -hmm. And so they spent the night just seeing it in their right. mind, going mm -hmm. through the whole process yep. in their mind. And the mm -hmm. more you do that, the better you'll, you'll have the ability to visualize. And, you know, visualization, again, is something that people hear a lot about in relation to self-improvement, but they don't necessarily practice it. Well, yeah. they practice it a lot. It's just negative. Right. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I used to tell people all the time, I said, you know, we're, I remember when I would listen to my kids when they were young playing in the room, whether with the dolls or army men or something like that, and how they could be, how they could occupy themselves right. for so long, where if we tried to do that, we wouldn't last a few minutes, right? Well, how can they sit there and do that? Well, it's because in their imagination, they put themselves in the stories that mm -hmm. they're creating. Oh, right, right, you yeah, know. yeah. Sure. We do the same thing. It's just that our stories now are a lot more scary. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so we we're imagining the worst: getting fired, yeah, wife right. leaving you, getting mm -hmm. guy got cancer, whatever mm -hmm. it may be. I'm going to fail, um, and so we don't spend much time utilizing this powerful imaginative thing. But mm -hmm. you could do that. You know, I remember when I was a kid working on trying, like free throws, and I would do. That. I said, okay, well, what if I just am, keep seeing myself doing successful free throws mm -hmm. you know will that will that naturally improve 
you know, because you, it's, it still requires a skill. You still yep. have to do that and mm -hmm. feel the weight of the ball and know yep. how much pressure. But it did yep. actually improve. I wasn't hitting every one of them, but I was hitting more because I don't know. I don't know whether it's just you, you suppressed that uh, fear or lack of assurance, but again, it, it freed you up to use your mind for you know, a better, better execution. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, um, all, um, professional athletes or, uh, professionals in any kind of work environment who are at top of their game, they absolutely freaking visualize success. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. Yep. yep. I know. I know. I, 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 I do that in everything I do even now. And it could be menial tasks. Right. Like mowing the lawn. Yeah. Yeah. This is going to be so good. <laughs> this is going to be so good. I'm going to manicure those pine needle islands. Like you won't believe. And I can see it before I do it. Yeah. It was like you said earlier, I forget how you said, it, but it's, uh, it, you know, the, the, the body and the emotions are going to follow what the mind is doing because the body and the emotions don't don't they can't they're only they can only be controlled or determined by whatever thought is held in the mind. Yep. You know that's why you can worry yourself to death. It's always mm. you know, it's fascinating that two people can get on an airplane. One is scared to death. Yeah. And the other goes right to sleep. Mm -hmm. You know, one releases endorphins, one releases adrenaline. Same airplane. Yep. But it's so it has to nothing to do with the actual physical circumstances. It's completely determined by the individual's interpretation of what an airplane means mm -hmm. one just another place to sleep till i get to my destination to another it's yep. an object that's going to fall out of the sky right <laughs> you know but that's an shape. object of doom but that's the thing is that but their body is releasing adrenaline mm -hmm. and cortisol yep you know what i mean the body is reacting to something that's not real right yeah yeah what does blower say fear false evidence appearing real yeah. That yeah. kind of thing, yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Mac, anything else you want to add to? No, nah, I mean, uh, you know what? The only other thing I, because I was rereading this, is I like, and I was trying to look for it right here. Lanny did the whiteboards, man. Mm -hmm. You know, he did the whiteboards. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, jotting the notes down on the whiteboards. Uh, oh, here it is. If it's on the calendar, it will get done. <laughs> Yep. Put your plans on a calendar. I use both a large monthly calendar in my office and a day planner. Mm. I love that. I mean, Joe and I were talking about that earlier when we were snacking in the kitchen. You know how I, man, I rely on those so much. The year planner, not so much. I mean, right. it's there. But the the month or the next couple of weeks and that day, the, yeah. the stuff that has to get done the next day, so freaking important. Especially if you're, those, because there's so many people who ask, who, who say, how can I get more organized? Right. Well, there's one way of doing it right yeah. there. You know, yeah. put your thoughts down on, it, it, because in your mind, they're all jumbled and you're trying to catch up. You're like, oh, this one, that's one. Get those whiteboards, you know? So you have one that's in one's in my laundry room and I pass it several times a day. That's this month, you know, next couple of weeks, right. what happens? And the one in my refrigerator is basically tomorrow. You know, what needs to be done tomorrow? Uh, it's nice when they're cleared, you know, like, <laughs> but, but, uh, well, but you know, usually, it, it, it goes back. I mean, if anybody's listened to you for any length of time, they've heard you talk about whiteboard. Everybody in the squad, mm -hmm. yep. you know, they all have they, whiteboards. They now. all have whiteboards because of, mm -hmm. of how much Mac has placed an emphasis on that. And I think sometimes, well, this gets into the over trying. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you're not. Uh, you're not controlled by the whiteboards. The whiteboards mm. are there to help you with your thinking. Correct. Keep you moving. And if something doesn't get done, you're not going to trip about it. Mm -mm. Just goes to the next day. Goes over to the next day. Yeah. yeah. Roll over. So, but what it does is it just gives you those targets. Again, keeps it off of your mind mm -hmm. because you can just look it up. See, because we, if we don't have that, then we can, it's one thing to have a lot to do. It's another thing to think about the fact that you have a lot to right. do. Right. <laughs> That's what messes yep. most of us up, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. We, yeah. we dread it. Overwhelmed. Yeah. I, I, what I, I like to say, uh, the more the more you talk about how long it's going to take and how hard it's going to be, then the longer it's going to take and the harder it's yeah, going right. to be, right? Yep. So uh, we've got to put that aside, and the whiteboards are a great way to do that. But so Lanny was talking about it in mm -hmm. <laughs> in the book. Your back's yep. like, say, so there's a lot of parallels between yeah, uh, yeah, 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 between him and yourself. Yep. Um, all right. So Lanny. 
um, Basham's with winning in mind, you guys, if we sh- man, we should be like, we should have like an Amazon affiliate link. Right, right. No kidding. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> he owes yeah. us. Um, mm-hmm. But anyway, uh, so that great, great book. I encourage yeah. you guys. It's a, it's a quick read, uh, very easy, and uh, I think you'll get a lot out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, Q&A. Cool. Pack back. So Q&A. I snagged a bunch of these questions for Mac. Um off of YouTube comments, which means now that I'm saying that, and this is seen on YouTube, we'll end up with more questions as people get savvy Mm -hmm. to where we're getting these from. Um, So Q&A is always a fun part of this. Um, I really want to get the best out of Mac, but I don't necessarily know sometimes what people want to hear, so it's good to, you know, for them to ask questions. these, These are pretty cool. All right, so question number one, Mac, big fan. One thing you always say is check your work through your sights. I find on a drill like this, my students start snatching the pistol back sooner and sooner. How do I get them to check their work through their sights and not snatch back too soon? Very difficult one, right? Because this is a training itis issue. I call it training itis because they were taught that, you know, because they shoot and snatch the pistol back. It's a real pet peeve of mine. So one is I demonstrate it. You know, and I talk about the importance. I said, just because you're firing one shot does not mean you're not training for two, for five, for 10. Okay. You need to, so instead of saying follow through, I now say, check your work to your sights. Get ready. If the drill requires one, always get ready for the second. If the drill requires five, always get ready for number six. Now, when it's most telling and when you make money is when you pull out steel. Uh. That's where the money is in this right here. Because now you're timing them, right? So you're seeing how fast they can go with single shot from the holster. And I say, if you miss, make it up. And the people who do not practice checking you work through your sights, that's when they get embarrassed. Because they'll throw the pistol out there, miss, and they'll snatch it back. And they'll go, oh, shit, ding. <laughs> you know, so, so do it on steel. And, uh, man, it'll be telling. It'll be real telling. And they'll, they'll, <laughs> then they'll figure it out. Then they'll go, oh, oh, okay, now I see. Yes, because if I miss, I need to follow up. So could you mark in your own mind when that started to happen, when people started to do that? Or was that always the case with people snatching? Oh, snatch, always the case. Okay. Yeah, out, out here in the, in the world right. versus at the unit. Yeah, yeah, always the case. So now, did guys do that at the unit early on and they got corrected for it? I don't remember it ever happening. There, oh, okay. So. All right. Number two. Why realign before reset? So what I tell people is uh, when I'm demonstrating pistol marksmanship, I talk through the process. Sight, 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 squeeze, 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 boom. The gun fires, realign the sights, reset the trigger. The reason realign before reset is because it happens first. Because I want both of them to be deliberate initially. I want hundreds of reps deliberately until we could do them fast. But the gun always realigns before we could deliberately click reset the trigger. Right. There it is. Boom. Because it's going to happen first, and they need to be both deliberate. So are people coming off the trigger? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Too fast? It's a hard one. It's a hard one to um, for a lot of people to wrap their heads around. A lot of people will just, they'll, they'll uh, just squeeze the shit out of the trigger they'll just snatch it right. boom and the finger will come right off okay so they're not checking their work for their sights not getting ready for the next right. shot they're not realigning they're not resetting question number three has this is in relation to a video that we posted that was one of the clips from the zoom call you were talking about superstars rock stars in special forces oh you know what god I mean? god, god yeah yeah because i read this i was like yeah what the hell? so What characteristics do the rock stars or the superstars have? What is it that makes them better? Well, they have um, an abundance of confidence because they perform better than everybody else. (laughs) So, so it's not it's not this false. So they're still unreachable. Yeah, yeah, they're freaking. They're just badass, man. They outperform everybody else. They're super confident without being arrogant about it. Right. You know, and that oozing confidence thing is cool as shit. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. it's it's a good thing to have confidence without being cocky. Right. You know, without being cocky. Yeah, yeah. So that's what they have. Well, let me mention this because, I, I you know, I'm, uh, I've been involved in personal development and all that sort of thing in, in, in my world for a very, very long time. Mm-hmm. 
before the mental motivator thing. Uh, a lot of coaching, a lot of teaching, a lot of that sort of stuff. So um, this whole thing about excellence is always been fascinating to me. Yep. So it's 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 but it's taken a gone to a different level since I met you because we're talking about things like this elite, you know, that sort of thing. Well, um, there's also an interesting thing about the unit versus other uh, special forces groups mm -hmm. because, and to me, it kind of makes sense about their selection process and who they select. Mm. Because the one thing that must be the case with someone like yourself being selected, the one thing that must be the case is they must be independent, which means they are not dependent on others, circumstances, yep. et cetera. So in other words, they have, which, you know, which a lot of the selection process, you are by yourself. Right. Whereas, for example, maybe set over against the Navy SEALs through their BUDS training, it's constantly a team thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a bunch of guys around the boat, a bunch of guys lifting the logs, a bunch of guys, and they all suffer for it. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're competing and working together as teams. Whereas for you guys, it's a very uh, lonesome yep. trail, yeah. <laughs> literally, <laughs> you know, that you're going through. But mm -hmm. what that demonstrates is the uh, self-dependence. Yep. And I'm not, I'm not misstating that. No. You know, that self-dependence, self-reliance. Self, yeah. Th th in other words, you are not there are so many people, whether they're entitled, victim mentality, you know, those who are on welfare or what have you, you become very dependent upon institutions, very mm -hmm. dependent upon <clears throat> others, very dependent upon the system that is around you. So therefore, if the system breaks down, you're, you're sunk. There's yeah. no innovation. There's no resourcefulness. Mm -hmm. There's no survival in you. So it's important for, especially in the Army's Tier 1 unit, to be able to select people who can operate completely independently. And that mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense to me. And so I guess the superstars are the most independent. Yep. You know what I mean? 100%. Because a lot of people can be easily taken out of the mix just simply because something breaks down outside of them. Mm -hmm. Or their own body yeah. breaks down and they're taken out. So you have to be mentally and emotionally Independent, yep. which means completely good, good observation, self-reliant, right? Yep. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> number four: How can one begin to become? This is a great question. Mm. How can one begin to become situationally aware? What are the key items or steps? You've talked about training kids in this, yeah. But where does a grown-up <clears throat> person who's now discovering the importance of this? Yeah, start? begin to become to become begin. Yeah, to become. So, so before, no, well, yeah. it, one is get out of forty-five degree syndrome, right? Get right. your head out of your phone. Right. In other words, get your head out of your ass. Right. Um, it, so let's take walking on the street in a restaurant, that kind of thing. Just relax. Just look around. Relax. Right. You know, because <laughs> because you don't want your demeanor to be out of whack. Sure. Because now you could look like a threat if you're freaking, you know, checking everybody out. You look like right. a nervous wreck. Right. Just relax. And the other thing is see things. Don't look for things. Right. You know what I mean? I think Varg Freeborn talks about that in, uh, in, in one of his books. Um, but and, I, and I'm probably saying it wrong, how, but he, he put it. I think that that's how he put it was see things. Don't look for things. Right. Which is which is a cool way of uh, explaining it. Um, but yeah, you just want to pick up information, you know, uh, just begin just to, cause begin to become, that was so funny. <laughs> yeah. Get your head out of your ass. Number one, get your head out. In other words, off your phone right. you know, when you're out and about right. and just look around, just look around, just see things, Yeah. you know, and it's funny because the, the more you just see the more information you'll start picking up. Yeah. So people can think, uh, which is often a criticism we might hear is, oh, well, that's just paranoid. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, but <coughs> but it's all one could argue it's you're interested. Yeah, you're looking around. You want to you want to see those people over there. You want to see that door. You want to see that car. Right. I'm just interested. Right. You know, when people are sitting with me outside of the pub, they don't in the, and I don't know them. I'm looking around, but I'm not trying to observe stuff. I'm just being observant. Uh, that's a big difference. Yeah, right. That is a big difference. Yeah. And, and, and I'm doing it nonchalantly, casually, 
and, and, and it's funny because a lot of the times, I mean, I'm looking at people in cars, but I'm also looking at birds and flowers too yeah, while I'm sitting yeah. there. <laughs> well, there again, there's the over trying again because, <laughs> right. because a guy can get a little too serious about this yeah, stuff yeah. and yeah. now he's no longer fun for his family to be out with. Well, and not only that, but, um, if the guy's looking for things, he could become target fixated. Oh. And now he's not seeing the big picture. Right, right. You know, he's getting sucked into one thing. And that's easy to do. Let's say a guy walks down the street and he's open carry. Oh. That's an easy thing to get sucked into. Right. Because um, you're, now you're looking at him without seeing anything else. Right, right. Yeah, just, just be observant without having to. Just, just begin to become. Yep. <laughs> Begin to become. <laughs> Number five, what's the difference between motivation and self-discipline? Which one is more important to you? Well, so uh, the difference is um, uh, motivation is the emotion of wanting to, it's wanting to do something, yes. right? It's, emotion, it's an emotional thing. You want to do something where self-discipline is uh, the things, doing the things that need to be done even if you don't want to do them. Even if you don't feel like doing it. Even if you don't feel like doing it, right? So which one is more important? No freaking way I can answer that because, you know, we've talked about it. I I have some some health issues and I don't, I can't rely strictly on motivation anymore. Right, right. Which sucks, man, because usually I'm motivated. So it sucks, bro. It sucks. So now I have to rely on discipline too, the process. I guess I would say self-discipline is the more important only because it's the one that right. always oh, works. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, good, good, good. Because I'm using that as a fallback now. Yeah. It's yeah. a backstop. Yeah, yeah, no, I would say that too. Because I mean, yeah, how, many, good, good, good. how many times have you been asked, Max? I know I've been asked this a ton. How do you stay motivated right. every day? I don't. Right. Me neither. Yep. So the issue is, what do you mean? Just to feel like you always want to do stuff every mm-hmm. day? Nobody gets up right. wanting that, be that all the time. You, you have to, it's getting yourself, as you said, to do the things you don't feel like doing, <laughs> yep. you know, because they just, they just need mm-hmm. to be done. Um, number six, as food and gas become more expensive, community seems crucial to survival. Any tips on how to build a community, how to recruit the right people, how to manage a group of people with all the different egos, basic leadership, et cetera? Yeah, the first, um, the first community you want to build is within the confines of your castle. Yeah. It's your family. So I'm, I, I'm, there's no way I'm interested in building a community. Right. No way. Now I have community, right? Right. I understand the importance of it. But one is, I mean, I prep, but my neighbors don't know what I have. Right. There's no freaking way I'm going to disclose that shit. Right. There's no way I disclose that I have uh, like extra gas and all this food and, and water and, and all this stuff. I don't disclose that to my, to my neighbors. Mm-hmm. Do I trust my neighbors? Absolutely I do. I've got good neighbors and I know if shit hits the fan, we will build a community, Right, (laughs) but I am not going to do that, um, ahead of schedule. So you're not going out creating the neighborhood watch necessarily. No, not necessarily. Now we have a pretty good. Your community is unique. Yeah. Cause we have a, we have a neighborhood alert system and, um, and we have comms, um, and we chit chat a lot, uh, and it, it's unique in different ways that I won't disclose right sure. here, but um, but it is pretty good. But but is but but I'm not going to recruit, and I'm not going to worry about managing different egos, any of that stuff. I personally am not. I want my wife and my kids to be self reliant, self sufficient. I yeah. want them to right. So feel first common. of all, you're, first of all, you're not a burden to your neighbors right. or your existing community. Correct. Right? That's the first thing. Mm-hmm. And the second thing is because you are uh, taking care of your own, mm-hmm. then should <clears throat> the shit hit the fan, as you say, right. then you guys are ready to be a resourceful community participant. Mm-hmm. Because under the under the cry, and I think people are just thinking in what's happening politically and. You know, whether it's gun control or inflation or food shortages, you know, they're they're trying, well, do we need to pool together and start organizing at the local level and that kind of thing? Mm-hmm. I, I think if 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 things went down in in general, I think your community would be, you know, would, would be we activated. Would, yeah, we would we would thrive. Yeah, it would act right. It, then it would activate. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking of you the other day. I was with my out with my dogs and and I saw uh, somebody 
because of the storms that came mm-hmm. through, the tree had come down. And <laughs> so it made me think of Mac, who, like, when he knows the the ice storms or whatever are coming, he's, he's like, already getting his chainsaw yep. together Yep, the Chainsaws, night before. Chainsaws, ropes, come along, all that <laughs> stuff. Yep, yep. Prepping all that stuff the night before, gas, lights. But then when you go out, it's not uncommon to see some of your mates. Yeah, doing the same thing. Doing the I'm same like, dang, thing. you guys beat me to it. <laughs> Damn it, man. <laughs> so yeah. uh, there you go. Um, number seven. Matt, can you explain how cardio is achieved in CST, combat strength training? Combat strength training, yep. Because the, the format, the recipe for success in CST is to work in anaerobic chunks in circuit to near metabolic threshold to meet an aerobic goal. <laughs> so you're basically working out for 30 to 35 minutes in circuit. Right. So the heart rate is always up. Right. It's always escalated and you're always breathing hard. Right. So there's your cardio. So ha- 30 ha- minutes. How <laughs> many times? I know, cause I know I've seen the question asked a dozen times. Mm-hmm. How many times have you seen the question? Uh, where do you fit in cardio? Right. Oh, tons. Yeah. Yeah. I fit in cardio every day. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know? Every day because I do CST. Somebody had asked it on the on one of the YouTube videos that mm-hmm. I post where you're doing the CST. You had the yep. whiteboard out, remember? I think people think cardio is just running. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. You know, I think that's what they think. Yeah. When do you get on the uh right. this thing yeah, or the stair thing, stepper yeah. or, or whatever, yeah, you know? Um do you do it fasted? Uh Stuart Smalley. Stuart Smalley, you Boom. did it. All right. <laughs> Dude, you're not as old as you say you are. <laughs> All right. Number eight. What Mac, what's the strangest thing you've ever witnessed or heard of out in the backwoods? And now by backwoods, he's referring to Montana. Oh, really? Oh, shit, man. Because I wrote a bunch of stuff. Well, go down, ahead. But not, well, the, the, I love that question because I just read backwoods, you know? Right. I didn't know he was referring to Montana. So, the, you know, I, nothing strange or uh, nothing strange, you know, just a lot of good nature and... Yeah. and Close encounter with Grizz. So strange shit was like, um, you know, the voodoo worshipers I talked about in in the SF course. I ran into voodoo worshipers one night at two in the morning. Another one before I joined the army, a friend of mine, we were hiking on uh, part of the Appalachian Trail and we ran into a freaking suicide dude hung. (laughs) Whoa. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was dead? Oh, yeah. For days, bro. It, It was, we, we smelled him first. Oh my gosh. So we had to go to the closest town. And, uh, you know, tell the sheriff's office. Wow. Um, another one was, you know, the hillbilly in selection. Right. Yep. And then, uh, that, so sound heard. Dude, this is a good one, and hunters will appreciate this one. The sound of a wood duck in a swamp. Sounds like a baby crying. Really? Yeah, so way out in a swamp somewhere, you know, and you hear this. It's like, what in the hell is that sound? <laughs> Anyway, there's a few of them. I was like that on our fishing trip, and you were like, those are frogs. Yeah. (laughs) All of them? (laughs) All right. uh, Number nine, what makes a great or better husband? Can you provide a short list of things to work on? Man, you know, this list could go on and on and on. We talked about this earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, um, here's a short list. uh, And no particular order. So my bride is my queen. I call her that. I respect her. She is the queen of the castle. Yeah. I consider myself a step below her in the castle. <laughs> I really do. Okay. She is the matriarch and she run she she rules the roost and I'm good with it. Yeah. I will follow freaking orders. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I will and and I am you know, yes ma'am, no ma'am. I mean, I don't say it like right, that, right. but but if she asks me to do something, I'm like, "Yep." I will get it done. Yeah. If I can't get it done right now, I say, I'm putting it on my whiteboard. I'll do it tomorrow. Okay. Uh, another one is, I because a lot of guys and gals, they give up on this. They're like, well, I'm married. Fuck it. Yeah. They don't look good anymore. Right. You know, take care of yourself. Mm-hmm. Groom. Take care of your physique. You know, uh, wax your freaking nose hairs, that kind of shit. Um, surprise her. So <clears throat> there, there's too many people, and I... I kind of hate this term um, because I think it's it's obligatory where people say date night. You can't have a date night. Right. We don't have a date night. Yeah. Uh, we don't have a specific day where we have date night, nor do I have an obligatory I love you. <laughs> That's a big pet peeve of mine. You right. know, when you before you hang up the phone, I love you. I love you too. It's meaningless. It's lost its fucking meaning. Mm. I will not do that. 
there's probably I I will probably two times a week tell Rebecca. I said Rebecca, I will look her in the eyes. I said I am in love with you. I am one hundred percent absolutely smitten. Hmm. You know about, yeah. but now there's meaning there. <clears throat> but I will tell her why. Right. You know, the obligatory I love you is freaking hate him. Uh, su- surprise her with those date nights versus having one. You know, surprise her with flowers. Surprise her with concert tickets. Um, total respect. I already talked about that one. Share things, share activities, share stuff. Do what she likes to do, even if you freaking hate it and you don't want to do it. Right. Listen when you don't feel like listening. You come home from work, you're tired at the end of the day, whatever. If she wants to freaking vent, let her vent and just nod. Mm-hmm. Be there for that. Be there for. Be there, be there for her, you know? If she needs to vent, you have to let her vent, man. You know, you got to. <clears throat> um, and it's so funny because Rebecca's done that plenty of times, and I'll sit there and listen, and she'll go, man, I am so sorry for, for venting, and, and thank you so much for listening. Because mm-hmm. they'll appreciate it. Yeah. And Rebecca always does. Um, selflessness is a big one. You know, um, in my mind, Rebecca comes first. You know, I make her coffee in the morning first before me. You know, I, I do things first. She'll have the first bite. She'll have the first this. She'll have the, you know, the um, the first <clears throat> choice of seat, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And another big one, man, because I think guys probably suck at this, is turn her on, man. Hook her up. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I like to pride myself as, uh, on saying that, I am not going to finish first. But once again, everything's a competition. <laughs> Even that. So I so in intimacy, I am not finishing first. Yeah. Ever. Right. Hell no. <laughs> Isn't it amazing you're talking about little things. Right? Yeah. Right. These are little things. Those are all little things. Yeah. yeah. We're not talking about the big you, people guys think, "All right, I got to take her to Hawaii." Right. Nope. And then you'll you'll live off of that for 3 years. Hey, right. I took you to Hawaii right. 3 yep. years later, you know yep. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so this made me think of something. There was a, a woman on my Facebook page. I remember her post the other day. She'd been on some dating sites or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so she would keep posting all these, you know, weirdos who've been, I guess, messaging yeah. her. But she said this, she goes, I received no less than 10 of these since the last time I posted one, I guess, you know, guys, yeah, right. she says, someone's got to know a guy who is age appropriate, has good hygiene, financially stable and a great personality. Right. They're not asking for much. No. Yeah. See, the hygiene thing, I think, is... I, I think I, it is. I, I, I do not want to be gross. That, that's like one of my biggest fears is I don't want... It, it, just now when we were um, RVing, um, I went to like a communal uh, toilet. You know what I mean? Yeah. Instead of using the camper one, because one, I didn't want to hear her. I didn't want her to hear me go and freaking potty. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Doing yeah. a dirty, and the other, and there was other dudes in there, and I came back and I said, Rebecca, man, I am so sorry if this is ever me, but guys are gross. She goes, Oh yeah, but women are too. Women, yeah. women can be gross sure. too. I said, Yeah, but but that's one of my. I don't want to be gross in front yeah. of her. Yeah. I don't want to have freaking nasty breath, shit in my teeth, freaking hairs coming out of my nostril, uh, a neared, you know, a neck beard, right. uh, ungroomed. Um, bo i mean that shit happens you know yeah. uh but like like skid marks and stuff like that are you freaking kidding me <laughs> bro i'm not four i remember a guy, a guy asked me because i saw his underwear oh my God. and i was like what in the hell and this is a grown man and he goes what tell me you don't have skid marks i go hell no i'm not four years old bro get you some baby wipes yeah what the fuck <laughs> Damn. Hose it down. But it was so freaking like normal for him. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, yeah, tell me you don't have skid marks. Damn straight. <laughs> I mean, unless I have an accident, which accidents do happen. He's like, yeah. I have no, you're like, I have no skid marks on my black underwear. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Um, why do you call Rebecca? Rebecca. <laughs> How did that start? So easy. So, um, if, if, um, <clears throat> If you're British or a Bostonian, any word that ends in a vowel also has an R on it. Like, oh, listen yeah. to anybody from Boston. Hey, you want some pizza? You know? Yeah. Pizza. Pizza. Yeah. Yep. And Brits will do the same thing. So that we, we, we were sharing pints with this one Brit 
uh, early on in our relationship. I forget his name. Um, but he would say, Rebecca, Rebecca. And it was always a little bit of an R. R at the end. Rebecca. <laughs> so it just went from there. So I started calling her Rebecca. And man, it really caught on. Oh, yeah. Everybody hears it. Yeah. Everybody in her work calls her Becker. Oh. <laughs> you know, it, like her friends too, like Ella. Yeah. I call her Eller. <laughs> And everybody calls her Eller now. You know, it's like, it, but a lot of them don't know why. Yeah, yeah. Which well, is that's funny. That's an interesting question. Yep. Mm-hmm. Number 11, how often should someone disassemble and clean their gun? It depends on how often you shoot. So if you shoot a couple times a month, then um, uh, you're probably going to, like, for me, it's like every 3,000 rounds. Right. You know? So, you know, a couple months. Now, if you shoot once a year, then you need to do it, even if it's 100 rounds, do it after those 100 rounds okay. because you don't want it stored with that carbon. Right. Yeah, you want to clean it, lube it, put it away. So gotcha. it depends. Number 12, related. How often do you recommend detail stripping versus field stripping for cleaning? Uh, some of that depends on the same thing. Some of it depends on the gun and how often you shoot. So, so like, for, for instance, a 1911, for me... Um, I'm going to detail strip that thing more often than I would a Glock. There's much more moving parts. It's more finicky okay. when it comes to debris, debris, uh. um, uh, than let's say a Glock or a, any striker fire type of weapon. But, uh, you know, but same thing. So if you, if you shoot often, uh, it'll be probably you know, once every few thousand rounds. If you don't shoot often, if you go to the range and you shoot one or 200 rounds a year, then do it right then. Gotcha. Yep. Question 13. Uh, when did you start using the word Debris? And- Debris, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any tips for working on flexibility? Uh, you know what? I, I, this is one area that I kind of lack in, so I listen to guys like Matt and the squad, okay. you know, or... Yeah. Or uh, Omega Project, dude. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, because man, they really know it. But it's important to static stretch. Okay. You know, like at the end of workouts, uh, and stretching is a boring thing, um, but you want to make sure that you have good shoulder flexibility, good uh, hip flexibility, that your hamstrings aren't super tight and your quads aren't tight and your calves. You know, the big the, hit the big ones, and just do the old school static stretching. You know, yeah. like. Bend over and touch your toes type of thing. You know, bending over and touching your toes does a lot because you're getting lower back, you're getting hamstrings, you're getting calves, you're getting shoulders, all that stuff. But um, it's one of the things that I I just, I should probably pay more attention on. Um, I do static stretching, but I don't have a lot of tips. Yeah. It's not a specialty of mine. Yeah, that's one of the things that I think I look back fondly on from taking martial arts as a kid right. was the emphasis yep. upon... Because uh, yeah. you would spend the first 10, 15 minutes of the class... Stretching. Just stretching. Well, because you needed to kick somebody in the face, bro. Exactly. <laughs> He's a high case. I think, mm-hmm. I, I think I had read or heard somewhere that David Goggins like stretches two to three hours every night. Yeah, well, he doesn't have a job. Yeah, <laughs> that is his job. Right? His job is the internet, right? Yeah, right. I, don't think, I, don't think, I don't think he does a job. Um, Okay, 14, what are your bad habits or was a past bad habit that you overcame? Dude, for me, it's the tobacco. That's my bad habit. Okay. You know, and, and I know it is. And it doesn't really bother me. The only thing that bothers me about it is I do not like being a dependent. Okay. I don't appreciate being a dependent. I mean, I like it. I like toba- chewing tobacco. I like it. But it is a bad habit. Right. And I know I am, I'm a junkie. I know it. I know it. And I admit to that. I am a freaking junkie. I've, uh, now you're speaking only of the, the dipping, the dipping. You're not talking about cigars. Nah, because cigars, you know, I don't do those often. I don't inhale. Yeah. (laughs) I might do four a week or one a month when it comes to cigars. But with the dip, I know that's a bad thing. And I started it as soon as I, I never heard of it before. I went to Fort Benning, Georgia, basic training. Mm-hmm. And I started it as soon as I went to basic training. Did you puke the first time? You- uh, I got a little sick. I didn't yeah. puke. See, I got the opposite. I kind of got stoned off of it. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I got euphoric. <laughs> but uh, it's a bad habit. But but I'm pretty good about it. I call myself a... Um, I'm, <clears throat> I, I dip with good etiquette. 
I am not a, I don't, I'm not one of these people that walk around with a spit cup. Right, right. Um, yeah, or a big freaking bottle. Oh my God. That's so what does Rebecca think of it? She doesn't mind. Okay. No. Unless I leave something around, like, you know, unless I spit a dip out in a, in a thing yeah. and she could see it. Right. But, uh, on your dinner plate. Yeah. I'm not, yeah. <laughs> All yeah. right. And last question, Pat, what do you think about, Target focused shooting in targets under is that fifteen <clears throat> yeah, meters? Yeah, fifteen meters. And or when closing with target, I don't understand the question, but yeah, I do. You. So basically, what he's talking about here and asking is it's called instinctive shooting. I am not a fan. Okay. So there's a lot of instructors, and I'll tell you why they do this, who teach instinct instinctive shooting. In other words, you push the gun out there and instinctively squeeze the trigger and focus on the target versus the sights. Right. Uh, people teach that because they suck at shooting. <laughs> Yep, and they and and they use it as an excuse. They go, right. "You're not going to look at the sights in a gunfight." I say, "Freaking bullshit!" Mm. Now, if it's a contact shot, you're not looking at the freaking sights because you might be shooting almost from the hip. Right. But if you bring the gun out and the pistol is in front of you, focus on the sights. Are you going to do that in a gunfight? Maybe not. Uh, maybe not. I'm if not it's gonna a say, subconscious. Yeah, right. I'm mm. not. I'm not going to say probably not. I'm going to say maybe not. Okay. You know what I mean? Because I'm not going to sell instinctive shooting. I am going to say you need to be able to discern and discriminate and put pl- proper and and ensure proper bullet placement every time. And in order to do that, you need a sight picture. Are you going to do that in a gunfight? I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Depends on the situation. But the focus on it in yeah. training. Focus on the sights in training. So you like the way I phrased that and was oh, careful yeah. not to say oh, yeah. certain things? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Those are that. good. Those are good Q&As. Absolutely. Really good. Um, wow. Well, it was good to do this again, Hell man. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. A yeah. lot of fun. So I hope everybody's enjoying this. I can't one. wait to get a dip right now. <laughs> <laughs> now that we're talking about it. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we'll, we'll speak, we'll talk about some other books along similar lines. Again, books that uh, have been a uh, very, uh, influential, influential for, for Pat Mack. <laughs> and so I know you'll be interested to get them. Um, but again, we mentioned at the outset, the keep the blaze alive coaching squad. We would still encourage you to join. You can do that at patreon.com mm-hmm. forward slash coaching squad. And of course you can follow Mac at, at T M A C S I N C. T Max Inc. Mm-hmm. and uh, very very cool stuff. Get on the YouTube channel because we're now posting there pretty much every day. Yeah, man, and good stuff is happening over there. So anyway, and this podcast will now be posted also on Max YouTube channel. Bigger yeah. audience, and uh, so it's good to do this again with you, man. We'll right try on. to do this a whole lot more. Yeah, often. we'll make it happen. Yeah. Anyway, CJ the Metal Motivator. Remember, whatever you do, don't suck metal up.